I was I was able to add myself into the calendar. I'm not sure if I, I've been allowed to add myself into the calendar, but I, I could see it. Okay. <laughs> so. and that's good. And then for next week, we don't yet have any talks. So if you have been doing anything related to the software, feel free to book a slot and, and talk about what you've been doing. Without further ado, I'll, I'll let Rory introduce us into bias classifiers and, and how the one he made sucked. So feel free to share your screen. Yes. Cool. I will share my screen. This one. Are you able to see my screen? Just yes. uh, looks good. Good stuff. OK, cool. I'll get cracking then. I have quite a few slides to go through. I think when I last checked, I was on 40 slides. So I need to be doing less slide a minute uh, to be able to get through this. So I, I'm going to keep going. So yeah, um, hi, my name is Rory. And I currently work at Columbia Road. Um, I'd like to, I'd love to <laughs> tell a lie and say that this is my working setup every day. And I always code with a Columbia Road sign behind me. But no, I'm actually at the Columbia Road office uh, on Esplanade. Um, but yeah, I actually started working. I've been in the Futurize family now for, I think, almost four years at this point. So I started at the start of 2017 at Columbia Road. That's me on uh, I somehow looking older than what I am now. But uh, yeah, and then I went to Futurize for a year, just over a year and a half, I think, or just under two years. And now I've come back to Columbia Road. So yeah, kind of like doing the motions through the uh, Futurize family. But actually, uh, yeah, this talk actually has nothing to do with Futurize or Columbia Road. So <laughs> basically, the links to Columbia Road and Futurize stop now. Um, but yeah, the uh, presentation that I'm talking about, a political bias classifier that I made, is from my 80 page master's thesis. So, yeah, there's quite a few things which I kind of want to talk about. Um, and primarily, this is also like a data science thesis, I guess, but I'm not a data scientist, which is why I wanted to present this at Tech Week Leaves, because I guess that kind of more is more in with kind of my my relationship to data science as a whole. Um, and there's also kind of like the minor mathematical side of things um, where I kind of want to talk about the baselines of like what model I used and kind of like the foundations of what I actually worked on. Um, but it's not the focus of this. So I have like a mathematical block that I'm going to go through really quickly. And then finally, yeah, this is about British politics. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try and minimize the amount that I moan about British politics and kind of like the uh, British media and their positioning on politics. Um, but I'm going to try and keep my opinions minimized as much as I'm feasibly able to. Um, so yeah, a background on the British print media. The print media is basically everywhere, all over the place. It's like fundamentally unavoidable. I think that like we're well, always uh, you read the news, you're kind of like you see it on TV, you're talking with people who have read the news and people are making reflections all the time based on the news that they read. And basically, this is fundamentally down to facts that are being supplied to that person. I know that, of course, like various news outlets in Finland have a kind of like supposed political leaning. And in the UK, this is like really, really, really exceptionally so. Like the newspapers are very kind of explicit in their political leaning. I would say maybe it's not so far as like the states and how their kind of like political biases are shown. But like in the UK, it's fairly explicit. You kind of read a newspaper and you can quite easily grasp like where they lie on this kind of like on the political scale. But yeah, we, we have, we, when we're reading the news, we can trust that the, the news that's given to us is actually kind of truthful and valid. We're, we're kind of like, often we're reading this and we're expecting this to be like, yeah, real news and, and not of the fake kind. Yeah, and then I don't know if you know about this. Well, as a British person living in Finland, there's this whole thing called Brexit. Uh, it's, not, it's not been huge news, quite a small thing. It doesn't change too much, no, not really. Uh, but yeah, so um, the UK voted to leave the EU back in 2016. Um, and it was a super narrow vote. So 48% to 51% or 52%. And actually the, the kind of the media in the UK had a really, really important role in this. And actually uh, one thing that happens in the UK surrounding general elections and um, general like referendums, votes, the, is the, uh, the newspapers in the UK will give explicit endorse to certain campaigns. So let's say for example, a newspaper will say, we want our readers to vote for this party in the next general election, or we want our readers to vote for this kind of, um, for this outcome in the, in the Brexit referendum. And so actually a lot of the kind of the main British um, print media gave explicit endorsements to certain campaigns leading up to the Brexit referendum. So yeah, 
uh, I basically wanted to figure out, is there a way that I can use uh, deep learning or like machine learning, I guess, as a whole, uh, to kind of like various techniques to be able to predict a political bias in the British print media? Like, am I able to read an article, like feed this into some kind of neural network or some kind of machine learning model that is then able to spit out and tell me actually, yes, this has a political bias towards this uh, outcome. So if in, the, in the scope of this referendum, uh, in the scope of the EU referendum, this would be either a pro leave or a pro-remain in the EU uh, bias. So that was kind of like the core aim that I wanted to go, uh, core thing that I wanted to explore. And there was kind of some like sub questions with that as well. So kind of like the first one is the overarching, like uh, can we determine political bias in the traditional print media? And then follow up, uh, how about for things like the BBC? So the BBC are meant to be unbiased and actually a lot of people in the UK kind of have opinions as to whether the BBC are biased or not. Um, and I was wondering how would I be able to actually determine the kind of political bias uh, in the BBC, what would my model say? And then uh, as a follow-up, uh, what kind of what kind of approaches, what kind of models would actually produce the highest accuracy uh, or would be like, in effect, quote unquote, the best model to be able to make predictions of political bias? So yeah, here is a kind of like a, a graph of, from a study by a kind of um, a company called YouGov in the UK. And basically what they do is they ask large groups of people they take massive polls on certain questions and what they did here is they, they asked i think it was a few thousand people in the uk across a range of kind of like age spectrums so like that gave a good accurate representation of the british population and they asked them about how they feel what's the political leaning that they feel for certain newspapers and actually this kind of showcases that a lot of people in the uk think that political bias is kind of like quite prevalent in the sense that say for example the daily mail at the top are considered by what, like 70% uh, um, to have some kind of right wing leaning, actually more than that even. And then the Guardian at the bottom are considered to be like exceptionally, it's not unanimous, but I mean like there's quite a consensus uh, that the Guardian has a left wing leanings. I was wondering that, and it, it almost feels quite intuitive. I mean, at least to me, when I'm reading the, when I'm reading the news, uh, I try to kind of read from various different outlets and it's quite easy or intuitive to be able to pick out that, okay, they do have this political leaning. So. Is there a way that we can formalize this if, if, it, if it almost feels intuitive when you're kind of reading it? And then here is like some examples of a couple of newspapers. So actually the left um, was actually on the day of the referendum uh, in the UK back in 2016. And this is like last ditch, pu last ditch push to stay in Europe. And it's quite like, yeah, definitely. And the big photo of Europe. So it's kind of like showcasing that we are all one and so on and so forth. And on the right hand side, you have this migrants pay just 100 pounds to invade Britain. And of course, like, I mean, this is pretty obvious that they're trying to push some kind of agenda here. And this is like being fed to people on a daily basis. And this is what people like, so many people read. And I mean, the British, like the physical newspapers are still like very, very popular in the UK and lots of people read them still. So they kind of like really kind of influential things and you see it everywhere. So yeah, and then this kind of like showcases that, yeah, well, um, the British print media are, are consistent. They don't change. Often like, say, say for example, more right-wing newspapers like The Times or The Daily Telegraph, they uh, will always kind of give endorsements in the same way. So if you kind of like, I think you can trace back to 26, uh, 2015 election, the 2016 election and the 2019 election, they all kind of uh, gave endorsements. And this was across the vast majority of the newspapers, they would remain consistent across various political campaigns. Um, and in the UK, the Conservative Party, um, I guess on the more kind of like right wing end of the spectrum, they gain the most support from the British press. So for, uh, in terms of if you were to divide down by the number of people who read all of these uh, newspapers and which newspapers gave which endorsements, the Conservatives kind of received the most um, kind of explicit endorsements from the newspapers. And here, yeah, yeah, actually, okay, so I have this graph here that showcases this. So the Sun is a conservative leaning newspaper, remains consistent, Daily Mail, conservative, and they have a tw 2019 uh, 20 in circulation, and this is in thousands, I think. So uh, 1.371 million, I believe that would be. Yeah, so really kind of like, these are reaching like a lot of people. Um, and yeah, and they all give like explicit endorsements. They don't hide it at all. It's, it's very like, we want you to vote for this party. So the BBC, yeah, the BBC are meant to be impartial. And I mean, like impartiality is a fallacy. There's no way that you can be totally impartial. Uh, but I, I mean, I admire the BBC. They, they, they give a good, like they give it a good go. And I mean, they have, there's certain annoying parts of the BBC. Like they, they can't recommend any one product. 
uh, from any company because that could be an endorsement in any direction. So they are like really, really, really try to be impartial. Um, and it's even in their editorial guidelines, like this is fundamental to their reputation and their values and the trust of their audiences. So this is kind of like an interesting area to follow up on and to try and research. Like did the BBC actually have a political bias, even though it's fundamentally written into their kind of like into their editorial guidelines. I mean, each individual writer or journalist for the BBC kind of has their own internal biases and opinions. So it's really, really difficult to like filter those out, right? So it, does the BBC as a whole kind of like have some kind of political bias? Yeah, and then so bias is kind of like, I guess the, like the main kind of core word in this presentation. Um, and framing bias is the one that we want to focus on. And that is when facts are conveyed in such a way to steer the audience's opinion in a certain direction. So here we are mostly concerned with the fact that uh, the facts, how the, how the facts are being given and do they subconsciously kind of push audiences into a certain direction. So statement bias will be opinion pieces, which I didn't study in this case. Um, and I didn't study how like how the articles were positioned in the newspaper. Of course, you can give more exposure to a certain story and so on and so forth. Yep, okay, here's the kind of mathematical part. And I'm gonna rattle through this really quickly. A, because I don't wanna get too stuck in the maths and B, because I'm not very good at it. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go really quickly. So you have the bias theorem. Um, yeah, which basically is like a really, really simple probabilistic method of being able to determine the probability of A happening in the occurrence of B. And so basically in this situation, we would want to find the probability of a sentence containing, um, yeah, having a certain programming bias uh, label Y given a similar article B, which is known to have a sim similar political bias. And this is like a really, really basic way or like a bottom line that we can use to determine or guess at least a political bias on a entire article level or an entire document level. So this is kind of like the, the baseline. And then we have neural networks. I'm sure many people have kind of seen these like diagrams of neural networks and like all of the exciting things that they do. But yeah, this is fundamentally just baseline of a multi-layer perceptron, um, which, yeah, sorry, I guess these, one thing to note with these slides is this is adapted from a LaTeX presentation. So there's kind of, I had to do some shimmying around today and I didn't quite get the superscript uh, done. So you kind of have to imagine that that asterisk is kind of like placed higher up. Um, but yeah, so we have like these multi-layer perceptron can be as part of a kind of like used in a feed forward neural network. So a kind of, this is a feed forward neural net. And then you each uh, like each uh, perceptron or like each of the circles there, it can be a classifier and then you kind of feed data forward. And then if you stack all of these on like many, many of these classifiers on top of each other, and you use these things called activation functions, which I'm not going to cover here because it doesn't really matter. Um, you can capture non-linear relationships in data. And so by the, the idea here is a, like a entire news article uh, with many, many different words. This is like, we want to capture really, really complex relationships between words used and different phrases that are used and different kind of like uh, parts of the article to be able to determine a political bias. So we want to kind of like, yeah, capture these really, really complex nonlinear relationships in, in the data. So the focus here is actually what the kind of neural networks that I used are called recurrent neural networks. And I promised they were super cool back in like 2012, um, not so much anymore, but like, <laughs> yeah, the kind of idea here is the difference between like a standard multi-layer perceptron where you have like different uh, nodes at each layer is that in a recurrent neural network, you're reapplying this function over itself um, and you have diff these, these different like uh, time steps. So you have this T on the far right hand side at each different time step. And if you're kind of imagining this, that um, we would feed in each individual word in the sentence at each time step. So let's say for example, we had like the sentence, Brexit was a mistake, um, being like Brexit was a mistake. Yeah, four words. So you can have like zero being Brexit, uh, H1 being was, and that's the input, so X, X0, X1. And so you kind of feed in these at each layer. Um, and it's that, the reason why you do this is it means that you're able to capture like the relationships over a long sentence. Um, so it kind of like, it, it is able to kind of model more uh, long-term data. And it also means that you can feed in sentences of different lengths. So I don't have to do any kind of like magic to be able to pad all sentences to a certain length. Um, I can feed in sentences of difference, which is really handy here. So yeah, there's different kind, different types of recurrent neural networks, each of uh, which I'm not going to go too deeply into. Um, recurrent, baseline recurrent neural networks actually suffer from kind of uh, problems, uh, which makes them not very useful when you start to deal with really, really long pieces of input data. Uh, so 
uh, in the case of my all the sentences that I was feeding in, sometimes I'd have really long sentences, and those would be really bad for these baseline recurrent neural networks. So I used a couple subsets or like more, slightly more complex versions called weighted recurrent unit uh, and a long short-term memory cell. And these are quite common. I think long short-term memory cells are maybe we're now sort of edging into cool in like 2016, 2017. Long short-term memory cells um, still I don't think so anymore. But like you know, it's getting slightly more up to date. Um, and this is a gated recurrent unit. This is like each of the individual cells. So you still have this kind of like uh, hidden layer at a time step. Uh, so you would have multiply, like multiple ones of these, like as you would here at each kind of level. So yeah, you're kind of like feeding through the data, but you just do a bit more magic in there to be able to preserve the more long-term relationships. So these, these are kind of better at dealing with more long form data, which is actually really good in the situation where I'm working with long sentences. So yeah, and one thing to also consider is that I'm working with um, word data. Um, and so I have to be able to find a way to convert a word, something like Brexit, into a number or a vector. Um, and so to find a way to be able to do that conversion. And I use this algorithm uh, or this model called word to vec um, which again was cool maybe like on the 2012 spectrum or something like that, uh, not so much anymore again. But uh, basically there's two separate ways that you can use um, word to vec um, to be able to create a vector or a numerical representation of a word. Um, so one is called continuous bag of words. And the idea is it has this kind of like given a, a sentence or like a, a window of words, so like a surrounding context, it makes a guess of what that, like the most related word would be given those context words. Um, and then Skipgram kind of intuitively works in the opposite direction. So you have some kind of word and it guesses the context words that would be around that, kind of like as a baseline. So yeah, I use this as well to be able to um, convert all of the articles into some kind of um, numerical representation that's called an embedding. Um, so yeah, and I, I actually trained, uh, so I trained word to vec I didn't use a pre, like a pre-made model by someone else. I actually trained this, um, over my, over my own input data. So yes, that's the maths. Take a breather. Um, I'm not going to go over there again, <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of like the main thing that we need to know for this at least. Okay. So what am I actually measuring as a part of this kind of like study? So um with the word embeddings i because i was training the model i i can basically tweak various hyperparameters or different uh, like configure different parameters if i'm imagining this word embedding to be some kind of function call i can change all of the different parameters that i'm feeding into this function call um and then i can just tweak those over time and see what results in the what generates the best results or what generates kind of like the best embeddings uh was i systematic with this no because i'm not a data scientist and i have no idea what i'm doing so basically uh, <laughs> trained a lot of different configurations and I kind of just like had a play around with them. Um, I used this like um, word pairing, um, this kind of metric of word pairings called Simlex 999, which basically is like, it would provide one word and another word and then a number to describe how rigid those two words are. And basically I would do uh, my trained embeddings and like compare the how how well it compares to this like a uh, gold standard method of word pairings. So basically this is kind of like a, a really kind of, I don't know, baseline ghetto way of being able to determine how my model was. And I use this as kind of uh, a good way to determine uh, which words embeddings to go with for the, for the neural network step. Then for the recurrent neural networks, I also did basically the same thing. I trained different, I, I tuned different parameters and I would basically, yes, it's again, the same, it's like a function call and I would put in different, uh, put in different parameters and tweak around just to see which model would perform the best. Um, was I systematic? No, I'm not because I'm not a data scientist and I have no idea what I'm doing. So basically, yeah, here I um, actually use the F1 score as a primary metric to be able to determine the quality of my neural network. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of like, and I also did a couple like a side tests as well. But yeah, and then I, I also thought like, I, I had been training my model a bit and kind of like messing around and I don't know, doing some coding, feeling like an elite hacker. Uh, and I was like, hey, maybe, actually, you know, I told my supervisor, my thesis supervisor, and he's like, yeah, you should try like with a more simple model just to verify. So I was like, oh, okay, fine, whatever, I know. Like, let's, let's try a knife wise. It's probably really simple. And I mean, it's just gonna take like five minutes and then it's gonna showcase that my models are so much better than this. Um, yeah, so it would showcase and I would keep it in the dust. 
but no, that's where you cue the ominous foreboding music <laughs> because uh, that's a big hint to the future. Um, but yeah, uh, this is how I how I actually did it in practice. So I used an API uh, platform software as a service called Event Registry, and I collected all articles from this kind of um, API, which basically would uh, return me entire news articles from, it was nine British news outlets. Um, and those would be between these two dates, which you have listed here. And this is one year leading up to the EU referendum vote. Um, so basically, yeah, and they were all relating to the EU referendum itself. I think it used, it had some fancy magic in the back end. And I kind of trusted that it, this was kind of reliable, even if it wouldn't be. And I got 5,232 articles, which is actually a really small amount. So yeah, that resulted in 101,415 sentences. Um, and because of the fact that the newspapers give explicit endorsement in the, in the UK, this meant that I could provide for each of these um, outlets, I would be able to give them a label. I would be able to say that, okay, this is the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail are like, a, no, a known conservative newspaper that want all of their uh, readers to vote to leave the European Union. So I can label this one. Um, and basically, and then for all of the pro remain articles like The Guardian, I would be able to label each sentence in an article relating to, um, uh, relating to the EU referendum with zero, indicate that it is uh, a pro remain sentence. And so this is kind of like my ground truth in a sense. Uh, it's a little bit, of course, it's very broadly applied and so on and so forth. But yeah, this was kind of like the, the baseline approach that I, that I went with. Uh, I used Python for all of the coding because Python is a language where you don't need to think about, well, I guess it kind of does the job for data science and that was nice. And then I used, um, and then I used uh, Gensim and PyTorch for all of the various machine learning things I needed to do. I was originally at the start, I was like, this is gonna be super cool. I can use SageMaker and I'm gonna feel like an elite hacker and it's gonna be really nice. Um, and then I was, I also, I was, well, I was a student at the time and I was like, I don't want to spend however much money to, um, to be able to train my models. And so I got, I was trying to train and it, it took a really long time, like a really, I don't know, it took like hours or like quite a while to train each time. Uh, and that got me sad. So actually after a couple of months of being sad and trying to persevere, I thought to myself, hey, what if I just try this on my home PC, which has a uh, NVIDIA GTX 980. And it was so much faster and I felt really, really stupid because basically <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to get everything to work on SageMaker and actually I could have just run it all on my home computer. But I learned and I, I grew as a result of it. So. so yeah, for the results in the word embedding side of things, here is a graph which talks about the correlation coefficient between my uh, kind of the embeddings or the, the uh, numerical representations of my words compared to this gold standard being Simlex 999. So a higher score is better in this situation. Um, and here, this is a, I believe the, for the two approaches that I had, I just realized I didn't label this, but if I go back to, where was it? No, it was down here. Yes, continuous bag of words. So I believe that continuous bag of words is this first one that I graph and the second graph is skip gram. So the two opposite ways. So I have, uh, continuous bag of, oh yeah, CBOW, continuous bag of words embedding here. Um, and so the one on the left-hand side and these like naming, I think the naming I perhaps could have improved on. I, I, naming models is really tricky. Like I feel like maybe I should have just named them after, I don't know, pet names or people or thing. Uh, would have been more interesting. But yeah, this is a window size three. Uh, and I think the size of the embedding itself or the size of the vector is 100. So some various tweaks there. And this resulted in, it, it gave the best result at a 0 0.14 on the correlation coefficient score. Uh, but Skipgram gave a better score. Uh, so this was kind of uh, close to 0 0.2. And I believe I read on the website of this kind of gold standard that I believe like an industry standard would be like 0 0.23 or something. So actually this was quite good. And I was really quite surprised that like the results here were as good as they were because I was expecting that over a smaller data set of uh, to train over that actually the embeddings wouldn't be so good, but then they're context specific and and they work in the domain of more this like politically charged um, kind of uh, words that might be UK specific. So might not be so well applied if we're training on American data or like that. So yeah, and I found this model on the left-hand side here resulted in the best one. And so then I did this visualization. Um, I did this thing called dimensionality reduction, which basically means you're squishing a vector, uh, like a length of 100 or something like this um, onto a, like a two-dimensional plane. And basically the, the reasoning behind this is then it means you're gonna get to see uh, clusters in the data. So each of these tiny little circles would actually be a word. And 
I don't know whether to be happy or sad at this because it kind of shows that it's one big blob, uh, but but also you kind of get to see like, I don't know, small micro blobs. So there's something in there to kind of take away. But it was quite a cool one just to look at at least. Uh, so yeah, oh, I'm running low on time. Neural networks, this is where it gets really sad. So yeah, I had my, uh, the best performing um, results and I had this uh, LSTM, so one of the recurrent neural networks, provided the highest F1 score. And I was like, great, this is so good. One of my uh, complex models did really well, but actually, no, it didn't. It did terribly. And you can see this here by having such a high precision score and such a low recall score. And these are kind of like, I guess, uh, like what we use to calculate the F1 score from precision and recall. And they're kind of like, it's like a type of accuracy, but this kind of, when these are two are very different, it showcases like a fundamental flaw in the model. And actually I showcased, when I demoed this, or I tried to use this model, I got really, really poor and it was super bad. It basically didn't learn anything. Um, and this is like, yeah, the, the accuracy score on the right-hand side. So this model was effectively invalid. It like just sucked. Um, and then in second place, yeah, um, that's the naive buys in second place because it had the, yeah, the best, the second best F1 score and also the precision and recall are really close and its accuracy on the test set was pretty good as well. So yeah, that made me super sad. Uh, and the naive buys as well to add insult to injury took about, I don't know, five minutes to train, less than that even. I think it was probably in the scope of like, yeah, minutes. And it just kind of like, ding, here's your model. Uh, and it worked. Uh, and it was really nice and I tried it and it was able to classify basic sentences into like a pro leave or pro remain. Um, and that was, that was pretty, pretty saddening. And yeah, so here I can see as well, um, these are kind of like the predictions so that uh, each model gave for certain newspapers. So a score of zero, would indicate that uh, my model thinks that this kind of uh, news outlet is entirely pro-remain, and a score of one would mean that this outlet thinks that it's entirely pro-leave. So let's say, for example, on the top row, uh, this LSTM Adam H64L1, what a great name, means that the Guardian uh, thinks that the Guardian, uh, across all of our Guardian data, is actually slightly leaning, whoops, uh, is actually slightly leaning towards a pro-remain philosophy. And that also applies for 2019 data, which is much more recent. So actually, it kind of like there's still the fundamentals apply. And then, of course, we can see as well for the Daily Mail, all of the models thought that it was somewhat pro-leave, uh, but actually the naive bias really, like, really hit a home run here because it was super, super confident that the Daily Mail was pro-leave uh, leaning uh, at a 0.83 and also even uh, uh, with more recent data, it was 0.74. And actually what was interesting here is, and this kind of gets scandalous, is the BBC is considered to actually be pro leave in this capacity. So this is like the clickbait headline that you can get from this talk. So yeah, does that actually mean that the naive bias was the best? And yes, it does. It means that it was the best performing model and I don't want to be told about this again. But yeah, and that made me sad. So what did I learn? Uh, don't do data science projects because <laughs> they'll make me sad. But no, it was fun. It was a fun experience. I enjoyed it. It was like a cool master's thesis project. But yeah, I had some flaws in my study, which I kind of want to go over here as well. Like I really broadly applied my ground truths. I kind of assumed that, uh, yeah, like definitely like all of the Guardian is, is a pro remain um, news outlet, which of course is not always the case. And maybe the models just learned the writing styles rather than the political biases. And to be honest, they probably did. They probably just learned the writing styles that are different between the newspapers. And also, uh, yeah, I didn't have that much input data. And the problem with that is there's only so many articles that are published uh, over the course of the year. And I can't go any further back than what I did because Brexit or the referendum hadn't even been announced yet. So yeah, how would I do this differently next time? I kind of went in with this uh, study or this uh, process in terms of like wanting to uh, I had the question, I was like, I want to figure out how to determine political bias in the, in the British print media. And then I like, I kind of formulated it quite heavily. And then I wanted to find the data. And that was quite tricky because then that basically meant that I had to like, I had to be able to like find the data from somewhere and then kind of formulate the question like, uh, and be able to somehow fit it into my question. Whereas of course, it'd be much better to kind of have the data first and then, and then formulate the questions surrounding that. So yeah, I guess that's where the whole data driven thing comes in. And yeah, uh, and like I said, with this whole naive bias thing, it kind of showcases the keep it simple first <laughs> and then go complex. I like, I guess the total net time was 1.5 years on this project, but I mean, I kind of like did it on and off and did it in like while I was doing other stuff and of course working at Futurice in Columbia Road at the time. So yeah, that was kind of, um, but yeah, definitely kind of go simple and then go complex.
Any interesting results? Yeah. Well, as I said, the BBC has a pro-Brexit bias. So this is the part where like, I, you can post all of the headlines and like phone all of the newspapers and be like, the BBC is Im isn't impartial and this study us that the BBC has a pro, has a right right wing leaning bias. But of course we can't really say that in practice, even though even though my study suggests that it does mean that it, it doesn't. So yeah, and that is a question on Slack, which I'm going to move, but yeah. And so the most simple uh, models perform the best here. That was kind of like, I guess expected. And I maybe should have treated that as like a warning sign um, because of the fact that uh, yeah, the most simple, even like the complex neural networks, the most simple ones to test. And I probably should have thought, hmm, maybe this means that I should be going with a more simple approach, but no, I wanted to use the shiny cool thing. So yeah, and I also wrote about this on my website at rory.how, and yes, that is actually the domain name. So it is also my full name, but you can go there and have a check. It's like, if you go onto it, then you'll be able to see, okay, well then www.rory.how, according to Olivi. But yeah, I, I also on the right bottom right hand side. So yeah, if you go to there and it's like the first, I think it's maybe one of them, you can see uh, the blog post on there. And I wrote about it a bit more, but yeah, that's everything. And that is my talk. So I hope you all enjoyed it. And I was only four minutes over time. So that's a net success from me. Awesome, thanks for the great talk, Rory. If you want to ask questions, go do that in the, the photo family Slack channel. Because since Rory is a, a roadie, he is not in the, in the development channel. I linked the, the right thread in the development thread as well. So I hope Rory is going to be available in Slack to answer yep. questions if anybody Yeah, definitely. Me. If you comment on the, the Tech Weekly's uh, Slack thread, which you're here posted earlier, I will reply to any questions there. Awesome.